Well, I'm uh, Chris here, and I've got a couple of friends with me today on the podcast. So I've got my buddy Thor up here. Uh, it's in Hong Kong. Can you say hi, Thor? Hello, everyone. Yes, and I've got my buddy Peter Williams down here also, who's up in Hong Kong. Say hi, Peter. Can you hear us, Peter? Okay, maybe. Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, yes, we're good now. Cool. All right, well, um, you know, this is a, a special uh, uh, Productive Accidents uh, podcast. So I first, I just want to kind of uh, let Thor uh, kind of share who he is, say a few things about what he's been doing. So go ahead, sure. Thor. Well, good morning from Hong Kong. It's 7 a.m. on this side of the planet. And uh, my name is Thor. I come from Denmark. I'm a modern day adventurer. Um, and, uh, I call myself a modern Viking as well. I've been traveling to reach every single country there is in the world since 2013. And a special thing about that is that I'm doing it all without flying and I cannot return home until I've completed it all or if I quit and decide to go back home. So I haven't been home now for seven years and I've reached 194 countries until I got stuck here in Hong Kong in early and uh, late January, it was 2020. Well, that's wonderful. That's kind of where um, our story picks up and I'm gonna hand it over to Peter here. So Peter, Peter obviously connected us and uh, Peter wants to explain the productive accidents and he can share your all's relationship and how this podcast came to be. So go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so I guess a bit of backstory, what are productive accidents? Um, mm -hmm. Think of serendipity or happenstance or you know, anything interesting that happens when you just embrace this concept that you, know, you expect good things to happen and, and, they, and they do. Um, so I've been playing with this idea for about 10 years and, and uh, you know, that's, that's a longer story. But what happened was um, another connection that I met through an, another series of productive accidents. His name is Adrian Bellick. Uh, I met him because he'd been couch surfing around the world for three years to make a documentary about happiness and uh, got to meet him over dinner one night. And I said, well, you know, you're a couch surfer. Where are you staying tonight? And, and this was a number of years ago. He said, well, I'm okay tonight, but tomorrow night. Um, it would be cool. So I went home and, and I mentioned to my wife, Catherine and the kids that, look, there's this guy with dreadlocks who's going to come and stay with us for a night or two. Are you okay? And the cool thing is they were totally fine. Adrian came and stayed with us and he's such a, an awesome dude. Uh, now he comes back whenever he's traveling through Asia or Hong Kong, he stays with us for a week or two. And he's actually created a new family tradition of hosting couch surfers or visitors, you know, come to Hong Kong, don't bother staying in a hotel. That's, that's one way of seeing the place, but it's a lot more fun if you can live with a family. And in fact, in fact, Thor can probably expand on this because he lived with a family that was happy to host him for a number of months earlier. Anyway, Adrian reached out to me. He's currently stuck in the Philippines because of COVID, working on a project there. And he said, you should check out this CNN article um, about Thor and his adventures. And that was enough for me to go, yes, here's another opportunity to meet someone interesting uh, connected to Thor on uh, Facebook, I believe, and that weekend he came around for a barbecue and we've been bouncing ideas and connections and collaborations ever since. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. And that's that's a good introduction of a productive accidents. And obviously you you met him and then you shared him with me. And now because of that, the three of us are in this space together. So it's uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking Thor obviously wants to go to his next country. Uh, Peter loves Hong Kong, and I would like to visit Hong Kong. So there's like this very <laughs> dynamic of the three of us <laughs> going on And he's on trying here. to get to Australia, which is where I'm from. And yeah, and I can connect him to a lot of relevant people in Australia. He might end up just staying up on the whole project. You know, it's a possibility. Well, that's true. I'm Anything's joking, possible. But, you know, Australia <laughs> is one of the countries that he has to get to. Oh, so it's one of the six that is left, uh, Thor, is Australia? Yeah, yeah, I've got nine of them left. And oh, nine. Uh, nine. Australia was planned to be uh, one of the very last ones on my way home. But the way that things have changed, uh, everything's up in the air. And uh, yeah, if I, can, if I could go to Australia next, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Well, you know, the, uh, let's jump into the gratitude part of this uh, talk where we're real simply. So Thor, in this moment, what are three things you're grateful for? 
Well, I'm grateful that I woke up this morning and I was healthy, no headache, no pain, uh, no loss. Uh, you know, it, it's, it looks like it's going to be a great day. I'm grateful that I have a roof over my head. Um, you know, I'm not homeless while here in, in Hong Kong. And I'm absolutely grateful for all of the love and support that I'm receiving from all around the world. I'm very, very fortunate to have this wonderful community that's following me online. And uh, they write me and they encourage me and they help me and they connect me. And uh, the same thing is going on here in Hong Kong through people like uh, Peter here. And uh, it's amazing to see this connection with you as well. So I'm really grateful for the people around me. That's wonderful. Uh, Peter, what about you in this moment? What three things are you grateful for? Well, I'm going to backtrack and talk about how we met. and. Uh, so I, one of the things I, that has helped me finish a couple of projects is um, one of Seth Godin's workshops. Uh, it was called the Creatives Workshop. And uh, I, I did that sort of as a, as a parallel uh, piece of um, learning, I guess, parallel to work um, just earlier this year. And it was a community of people that wanted to finish projects. So, you know, it, it was um, trying to create a 100-day streak in whatever your project you're working on. And, you know, like if you're a musician, pick up your guitar and perform something every day. If you're a poet, pick up a pen and write something every day. In my case, I was trying to finish a book, pick up my laptop, and every day that I made any progress, I would put a dot on a 10 by 10 grid. And I tried the day streak, and that's what helped me finish the book. So I'm grateful for that community. But not only did I finish the book, but I was able to um, just listen in and enjoy other conversations. And someone along the way introduced this uh, group uh, or this, uh, this series of, of dinners in New York called Gratitude and Pasta. And I'm, I have a gratitude project as well, which so it resonated with me immediately. And I thought I, sh I should check it out. Similar story to meeting Thor. I reached out to Chris Schember on, on, uh, on Facebook and said, I heard you're doing these dinners. They're normally physical, but because of COVID, you flip them to, to uh, virtual. They start at seven, seven, in New York time, and I think, and I've joined a, a, a few of these different uh, um, events, and each of them have turned into interesting connections and collaborations. Uh, and in, in fact, a month after I attended that first dinner. Um, they reached out to me and said, hey, would you, would you like to join another one? Um, here are three different dates that you can choose from. And I thought, well, why don't I choose all three? And each time I'll bring a, a friend. So another Chris, uh, you know, Chris Davis in uh, Taipei uh, is a contact through LinkedIn that we'd start a, a conversation with. And I invited him and he, he enjoyed it so much that the following week, he offered to take the group on you know, a virtual walking tour of out, his type of accident that came out of, you know. Mm -hmm. your, okay. your mic it's, keeps cutting out. I don't know if it's your Wi-Fi signal or not. Um, you can continue. I just want to let you know. Well, let me try and see if that works. I'll go into regular data. Sometimes it does. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, this is a, a long yeah. gratitude story, but it's 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 a good one because what ended up happening was I hosted a, a walking tour of Hong Kong the following week, and uh, Chris Shembra said, "Oh, you should you should meet Chris Palmore. He's got a gratitude thing as well, and that's how we connected, and it's turned into a series of conversations." So I'm going to say the creatives workshop is gratitude number one. I'm going to say gratitude and pasta is number two. And I'm going to throw out creative mornings as the third one, because that's happening off the back of this. Uh, the Hong Kong edition is at, starting at around 8 p.m. Uh, sorry, 8 a.m. our time. And by coincidence, uh, Adrian Bellick is the, the Hong Kong guest this, this month. So there's a few different universes uh, colliding uh, in one morning. That's great, man. Uh, it's a lot to be grateful for. I, lo uh, I love the backstories on that. Obviously, uh, you know, that's, it's nice that 
to hear those stories and, and tie it into why you're grateful. Um, you know, so Thor and I were talking last week about this podcast and I thought, you know, he, he obviously has been and seen a lot and we, we were discussing like people being kind to him or seeing people, him experiencing kindness in his travels. And uh, one of the times he said he'd like to share was uh, basically could share your experience. You said in Poland, right? Was that one of the ones we were talking about, Thor? Yeah, yeah, I have a really nice story from, from Poland. You want me to go ahead now or? Oh yes, please, yeah. I'm sure. So this was really, really early on in, uh, in this project. We named this project Once Upon a Saga and I left Denmark on the 10th of October, 2013. And, and it was sort of still taking shape. And um, what I knew at the time was that I was aiming at reaching every country in the world without flying. But the, the cultural elements of going through different countries and different places was a lot le lesser than what it is today. And uh, the people element and, and describing the people I meet and, and how kind people generally are around the world wasn't really an element at that point as well. And um, within December uh, 2013, um, I was in Poland and uh, winter was, was coming across. And um, one thing led to the next and I got on a train and I went up to a small town, smallish town in Poland at least called Suwalki. And they mm -hmm. joke about that in Poland and they say, this is the coldest place in all of Poland. And it was winter time. And I just needed to, I was on my way. I wanted to go to every country in the world. Let's go, 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 buses, trains, let's go. And um, I needed to spend the time up there and I couldn't find a place to stay. Um, I was searching the internet and I was searching, I was trying all sorts of things and I couldn't find a place to stay. And then the hostel I was staying at in Warsaw in, in Poland, they said, we, well, we can make an internet search in, in Polish. We're sure we can help you out. There. So they came back with a list and it, well, there was a name and there was a phone number and uh, there was an address and uh, they said uh, we spoke to this guy he doesn't sound very friendly at all but uh, in the end you just need a place to stay for the night and uh, there's the price so if you're okay to pay for this just show up and pay the money spend the night and leave early in the morning and you'll be fine I went, oh, thank you very much and you guys are so kind and i got on the train and i went up to suvalki and then um for whatever reason, I didn't search the address. Um, so I had the address on a piece of paper. I didn't have a SIM card. And, um, and I went up there and I figured, well, I'm, I'm just going to ask someone in Sovalki and, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll point me in the right direction. But when I arrived, it was quite a small train station and, um, and it was snowing and the, the white landscape and it was cold and it was dark. It was late in the evening and four or five other people, they got off the train and they just kind of dispersed like this and they were gone. And there were no stores that were open, no cars were driving around. It was just this winter landscape with houses and people and, and no activity. And I was wondering, well, so who am I going to ask? How am I going to find the address? And then normally I would try to head towards the city center. And, and you can identify that sometimes by that the buildings are taller or you'll see the, the tower of a church or something like this. But there was just no indication of where the city center would, would be. And then I think, okay, I'll walk in some direction. So I just said, okay, I'm going to walk this way. And I was, I, was, I was walking for five minutes and I didn't see anyone. Nothing was moving. <laughs> just, just snow and parked cars. And I walked for 10 minutes and nothing. And I walked for 15 mm -hmm. minutes. And, uh, and then I was in this intersection in a, uh, in, a, in a residential area. And I was just there with my hat and my beard and my backpack <laughs> and the snow. And the wind was sort of picking up a little bit and, and it was getting later. And I was wondering like, how, how am I going to solve this? But you know, I have the address, I have this, um, but you know, is it going to be within the next 10 or 15 minutes or is it going to be within the next couple of hours? Mm -hmm. and, and while I was standing there wondering uh, what to do, a door so, so certainly opened further up the street and uh, a woman sort of came out on top of this staircase and the light behind her, and it was, like, it was almost <laughs> like angel. A, a vision. <laughs> yeah, they were like, "Oh, this is good." And I quickly ran over there, and um, and she was sort of surprised to see me in her neighborhood late at night. And I look at him and go like, "Hello, how are you?" I thought, like, "I'm I'm fine. How are you doing?" And she was good. I was like, "Well, um, so I'm uh, I'm trying to find this address. Do you know where it is?" And, oh, by the way, do you speak English? Do you speak English? <laughs> and, and she and she looked at me and she went, uh, "Yeah, yeah, I speak English. I'm an English teacher." Like, oh, that, that was very lucky <laughs> um, out of all the people. So I said, well, this address here, I need to go there. And, and, and she's looking at me and go like, what, the, what, 
what in the world are you doing here <laughs> late at night? So, oh yeah. And I didn't want to get into my full story. So I just went, well, I'm, I'm from Denmark and I'm traveling and I need to go to Lithuania tomorrow. And, and Svalky is nearby the border. So I'm, I'm trying to find this address and uh, I'm going to stay there for the night. And she, she had a look at the address and she went, well, yeah, yeah, I know where that is. It's not too far away from here, but, but wouldn't you much rather just stay at my house? And then I was, I was looking at her and then I was thinking, oh, I don't know about this. I don't know this woman. She might uh, lead me down into the basement and no one will ever see me again. Like, I, I, you know, <laughs> who, who knows about this kind of stuff? So I was smiling, saying, oh, thank you very much. But this, this man here, he's expecting me and, and I, I have to get out there and it's getting really late. And she was, oh, there's a phone number. We can call him. We can tell him that you're not coming. It's not a problem at all. And I was thinking, well, what am I going to do here? And then my next thought was, I should be more open. That the plan was I was going to go to all of these different continents, all of these different cultures. I was going to be meeting people all around the world. Um, I should be a lot more open and uh, I should take some of these chances. And, and this woman, she looked kind of harmless and, and what could really go wrong. And, 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 and let's see about that. So I accepted her offer. And then uh, she said, okay, she just needs to move her car. <clears throat> her car, that's the reason why she came out of the house because a storm was coming across and she was worried that one of the trees nearby would fall in her car. She said, you wanted to move that. She did that. And then I followed her inside into the house. And then uh, she goes in ahead of me and she takes her coat off and her shoes off and she goes in towards the kitchen. And then while I'm kicking my boots off and relieving myself of my big bag, and then I, I realize she doesn't know my name. She doesn't know the first thing about me. I'm, in, I'm inside her house. So I go, by the way, my, my name is Thor. And she goes, oh, that's very nice. My name is Maria. By the way, are you hungry? Because it's really, really late. Uh, you must be hungry. Uh, do you want something to eat? And I, uh, I, I say, no, no, I'm, don't worry about me. I'm fine. And my stomach is going. <laughs> and she looks at me and goes, oh, no, I'll, I'll cook something for you. So she starts cooking. And it's almost midnight at, at this point. And then we sit down at the table and we start talking. And her, her daughter wakes up and comes down the staircase. And, uh, and sees me sitting there with her mother in the middle of the night. And I, I do not speak Polish, uh, but I'm fairly sure that I know what that daughter was saying. She was going like, mother, are you crazy? You can't invite strange men in from the street in the middle of the night. Like, it's just the two of us here. We're defenseless. What are you doing? But the daughter also spoke English and she happened to be a lawyer. And um, we spoke with her for a bit and then she went back to bed. And then um, after a while, Maria said, okay, let's, uh, let's make the bed for you. And then she actually let me down into the basement. And uh, there was a- there was <laughs> She a did end up in the basement. <laughs> she went into the basement. And there was a guest bed and she made that for me and she brought me a towel. And all these and... torture racks and books on the wall. <laughs> no, no, none of, none of that. <laughs> Maria was amazing. And then um, she said, okay, good night and I'll, I'll see you in the morning. So the next morning I woke up and they went like, yeah, you want to have a shower? And they were making breakfast for me. And the daughter was mm -hmm. there. She was making coffee for me. And we sat down and we talked for a bit. And then the next thing that happened was that Maria said, I'll drive you to, I have the car, as you know, I'll drive you down to, to the bus and that will take mm -hmm. you across to the border. So we drove to the station and then um, she stopped in front of the bus and she went like, okay, uh, are you fine? And can you make your way from here? And I went like, this is absolutely amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the project motto here uh, within Once Upon a Saga has from the very beginning been a stranger is a friend you've never met before. Mm. And that was essentially something that uh, me and some friends, we thought it sounded nice and it would go well with a project like this. But it has been proven over and over and over again. And the Maria story for me is a key story to say, what do I mean when I'm trying to say a stranger is a friend you never met I, I've never met Maria. Maria's never met me. She, none of us, we knew that we existed. And she invited me into her house, house and she fed me and showed me all the kindness and hospitality. And she even drove me to the, to the station. You know, someone else might just have had a look at the paper and gone, yeah, you go up to the intersection, you turn left and then you turn right and it's the second house. Or, or on a really good day, maybe they say, you know, I have a car. I can drive you there. It's a five minute drive. But she invited me into her home. And then you also have to look at the chances of all of this happening because right. I arrived with perhaps the last train of, of, of that day and I chose I was going to walk this way. So I walked 15 right. minutes in this direction, but I could have been walking that way. She was coming out to move her car. She could have come out to move the car five minutes 
earlier or five minutes later. There were so many things that had to happen in the right order. And then on top of that, um, she had to be an, an open hearted, open mind, very, very kind person. And, and the interesting thing for me now, seven years later, is that she's far, far, far uh, from, from being the only one out there. I've seen so much kindness and so much hospitality from a multitude of people around the world. So yeah, so that's the Maria story. That's a good that's, story. That's beautiful. What do, you, uh, what do you have any thoughts on that story, Peter? Anything that's sticking Absolutely. out to you? Yeah, well, right here in Hong Kong, we have uh, another uh, contact who has embraced this idea of kindness. In fact, he has a hashtag, kindness matters. Uh, you know, it's almost like his brand, or it is a, a brand for um, an NGO here in Hong Kong called uh, Impact Hong Kong. So Jeff Rottmeyer, um, I don't know how many years ago, it's only three or four, I believe, started a series of blogs where I think he and six friends would choose a different topic. And Jeff's topic was kindness. And other people might have had something on design or photography or something. Uh, and those blogs evolved into um, walking into poorer neighborhoods of Hong Kong and taking boiled eggs and water to give to the homeless. And over time, that snowballed into, I think they have about 5,000 volunteers right now. They have a kitchen in that neighborhood. It's become a fully fledged funded uh, NGO. And what's amazing is I only heard about it again through Creative Mornings. He spoke there um, earlier this year or late last year. I think it was late. I think it might have been January. Anyway, um, and that encouraged me to go on one of his kindness walks where, you know, four or five volunteers um, went around the neighborhoods. And uh, there is this community of homeless that live in one of the, the suburbs here. Uh, and what's amazing is he has actually gained the trust uh, of. Uh, you know, he's gotten to know this community of people and he's helped, I think it's up to around 200 people that he has uh, helped back into accommodation. And not only that, he's created an ecosystem where he can employ them and help them regain their dignity and everything else. And, you know, you think of old typical projects, if you just put a homeless person into an apartment, that's not going to work because they, they actually don't, you know, you need to actually, uh, you know, he talks about... The, 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 the main ingredient that they're missing is love. And, you know, it's such a beautiful story that he's, he's now got created, I think three uh, NGOs, one that helps children and, and families, uh, adults with, with Down syndrome. He's created an activity center where it has dance, art, um, sport in one venue. He's got a clothing store where he sells affordable clothing to people that, that uh, are trying to rebuild their lives. Uh, and anyway, I'm, and I love what he's been doing and we've been trying to promote things like that, but kindness matters is, is, is his theme and it, it sort of ties into some of the things that Thor was talking about. Helping strangers is, uh, is a superpower for sure. Definitely. Yeah, it's beautiful, man. Uh, you know, I, I was, it, this, this all evolves around gratitude so much and I was even talking to Thor earlier about it, you know, the, the uh, being kind to somebody is a catalyst for gratitude to exist. So. Uh, the amazing thing is, yeah. is when you allow somebody to have time or you're kind to somebody, you are allowing a space for them to be grateful <laughs> for, for that, which is beautiful, which Thor tells a story. I can tell he's so grateful about it. I'm grateful to hear it. I don't think you, we can hear enough stories of people just opening up, you know, uh, just being kind to people, giving, I mean, I mean, being able to give a space to stay and food and shelter. I mean, that's, I mean, that's so massive. And then I love Thor sharing the story now after traveling so far, because that, you know, falls in line with my whole idea of like gratitude cube, where you sit in a place and you start to think back to this had to happen, this had to happen, this had to happen for me to be here. And when, like you said, all those elements fell into play with that, with Diana, that you happen to, you know, all those little things, you know, um, there's a great movie called uh, Run Lola Run, where she, you know, it's four times. And it's like, if she, you know, if for instance, if Thor makes a right out of the, out of the train station, that never happens, you know, or if she decides, you know, maybe she decides to take a shower before she goes, moves her car, right. That never happens. Like all these things. Right. And when you, when you sit in a place of appreciation, for something had happened you can look back and go wow that's so cool right there's like magic yeah. there you like appreciate it well, so much more it's a it's the definition of a productive accident it's exactly the same concept you know converging 
Um, and once you describe the phrase or the concept, then people can say, oh yeah, that's how I met my wife or that's how I got that job or that's how I, you know, you, once you've got the vocabulary, you start to see it everywhere and it becomes quite predictable and repeatable when this, you know, you get curious people together, you, you keep talking until you find something that you both care about and then you collaborate. And then these, comp these collaborations compound over time. So for instance, Chris, when we first met, you said, yeah, you're going to start this podcast. You interviewed me. Then you said, I'm writing a book, uh, a gratitude anthology, and you're calling for essays from people around the world. I shared that with my daughter in Melbourne. She's written an essay. I shared it with Gail in uh, Milwaukee. She's written an essay. I shared it to Nancy, a, a lady I go walking with. She wrote you're an essay. MVP, you're so my MVP all... there, buddy. You're one of my MVPs. No, but you know what I mean, you know, everyone can be part of this, this whole movement that you've created, which is fantastic. So thanks for all the work you're doing, Chris. Thanks, Peter. Um, I love that, man. Yeah. Um, and then here we are with Thor again, you just uh, gifting me these wonderful people in my life. So it's, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure. And I always speak very highly of you for very good reasons, Peter. <laughs> Uh, well, Thor, um, you know, one of my go-to questions are, uh, you know, if you were to explain gratitude to like a 10-year-old, how would you go about doing that? I, well, that's a good question. Um, I suppose you would have to explain that they are receiving something and it's their mm -hmm. reaction to, uh, to receiving it. Um, if, if they see it as as something common, something um, uh, something that has less less meaning to them, or if it's something that, in one way or the other, is going to impact them, is going to impact their their mood, is going to impact their, what's going to happen next. And um, I would say, if that's a positive reaction, then that would mm -hmm. be gratitude. Okay, that's great. You know, I, I was talking last week to a guy, and he gave the metaphor of it's. Uh, he said it's it's uh it's if i was explaining to a kid he said it would be that after we get finished eating we clean the table which i thought was really interesting he was basically saying like with the appreciation of the food and the placement of it is that we now we 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 clean up our space as a oh, show of appreciation see, for see. what you got um which i, I thought if you know, i would have to is, if i would have to create a metaphor then i would say that if you're shivering and you're cold and uh, you come inside a warm room or you put on a jacket. Uh, yeah, there you go. I love that. That's a great metaphor. I love that. That's that's a really great metaphor for gratitude. I love that. You like that, Peter? Yeah, because it wraps around you and it's a feeling that you you get, right? The sensation of acknowledging something that good that's happened to you. Uh, I mean, just briefly, how I discovered this whole idea of gratitude was I attended a, an event, uh, General Assembly, which is kind of like night school for startups. and. Uh, there's a guy, Mush Panjwani, who was speaking and his, his theme was the essence of an entrepreneur. And um, one of the stories that he created was he'd actually been made redundant, you know, and he, he was, I think he was 47 or something like that. And he's actually very good at what he does. Super motivating, super positive sales training sort of guy. Um, but, you know, he's such an optimistic guy that he said, well, you know what? I was going to quit in a few years anyway and, and write a book. I've been doing some blogs and I wanted to put them together. So maybe I'll just start now. And what I loved about his story is that he, he sort of integrated a story of gratitude as well. He said, look, if you've left a big company, how do you stay focused and productive and all these other good things when you don't have this infrastructure around you? And one of his methods was through gratitude. He said, look, if, you've got, if you can have a shower with fresh running water, you're already better off than 80% of the people on the planet. So keep things in perspective and always maintain you know, this humility and all these other things. And what I loved about his story is that he, he created a, a daily habit of getting up at 5 a.m., going for a swim, having a good breakfast, being at his desk by 7 a.m. And he knew that he was creative in the morning from 7 till 11. And that's when he focused on organizing his blog and, and writing this book. And he actually reverse engineered his book. He said, look, I want it to be 100 pages and I want to finish it in 100 days. That means I need to do a page a day. And if you're up early and you're being creative and productive for four hours, you're probably going to get it done in 30 days. But through that story, I started a, 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 a project to, to compile my first book. Uh, and I was on a flight to Melbourne and I thought, okay, I've been following Seth Godin and he, he encouraged you to, to do something creative every day, write a blog, uh, just ship it out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it out there. 
And I was saying, well, I'm not going to write about business or finance or whatever, but maybe I could take that idea of gratitude and come up with a concept. I was reading uh, Malcolm Gladwell at the time. He talks about 10,000 hours and how you have to be, you know, you have to do 10,000 hours of practice to be an expert in anything. So that's where my gratitude project was born, 10,000 thank yous. And, you know, I don't know what I'm up to, 1,250 or something like that. But that discipline of looking for something that good that happens every day, and it could be just someone that holds a door open for you. It could be someone that does a presentation via Zoom, such as last night, a guy from uh, New York did a presentation for us at work that I just sent a, a thank you on, on uh, LinkedIn to. You know, this event today is a, is a no-brainer. Take a screenshot, <laughs> share that broadly and say, look, check out this podcast that's just gone live or whatever it is. Uh, so anyway, that's the backstory. And, and, you know, I think explaining it to children is powerful because it's a gift that they will travel with them through life. Uh, and help them get through difficult situations. Yeah, it's great, man. I, um, I I do love how your your gratitude story started, and the, the fact that you're uh, dedicating yourself to um, these, you know, set, setting a goal. So it's like you have intention with what you're doing, which keeps you keeps you in that mindset of looking for things to be grateful for, so that you can share the appreciation. And obviously, you know, I love the fact that you put it online. And that you let it fly, uh, you know. That you let it. You, you don't keep it. You don't keep it to yourself, which is fine. People can keep it to themselves, but uh, you know that's part of my bag. Um, you know, Thor. I was thinking when we talked last week. You shared something really great with me. You know, uh, really, we were talking about perspective and how you know. Obviously, you've been uh, kept in Hong Kong, but you, you know, you shared some stuff about that. Something you shared a book and perspective. You know, a way that helped you have a perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you mind just sharing a little bit? Cause I really loved it. I really loved our little discussion we had about that. I don't, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I don't know if I remember the discussion in, in particular, but, but the, the book you're referring to is called Endurance, I believe. And it's about the uh, Shackleton expedition to the, to the South Pole and to Antarctica. And the idea was in in 1911, they reached the South Pole, and uh, then in 1914, this expedition, they, they wanted to cross Antarctica from one coast to the other. And they sailed down there in the beginning of World War I, and uh, there's no radio connectivity, there are no satellites, there's none of that stuff. It's a wooden ship, and uh, they quickly get stuck in the ice, and uh, they have to overwinter on board the ship stuck in the ice. And... Um, and then the next thing that happens is that the ice crushes, it crushes the ship. And they are 28, <clears throat> 28 men on board and they have to abandon the ship um, in this ocean of ice and snow and whiteness. And uh, there's, a world, uh, there's a world war going on. Um, nobody cares about these 28 lives. People are dying every day. And if they give up, uh, they're dead. Uh, so, they are going through extreme toughness, um, frostbite and uh, fear and peril and danger in, in various ways. And then they and bump into Maria. Is that what you're going to tell us? Yeah, then, then this door opens and <laughs> this light there and this like, angel comes out. What, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> are you crazy? She, she, she cooks some food for them and leads them. It's, down a, it's a real surprise ending. It's a really surprise <laughs> ending. No, I, I loved what, what I was saying when we were talking last week was obviously, you know, you've been in, you know, you've been in Hong, you know, you have the, you've been on the road for seven years now. Yeah. You, you were so close to finishing this massive project of travel, you know, and what you said to me was that, you know, you read this book and it just gave you perspective. And I, and exactly. I, and I thought, and that's where the beauty was is obviously um, we, obviously it's like mentally we all get bogged down with stuff that upsets us and puts us in a cage and you obviously I can completely understand why you would be very upset yeah. <laughs> in this journey but I love the fact that you're like look somebody recommended this book endurance uh, and I read it and it made me go you know what these people have problems you're like no, yeah. that, that's some that's a real that's, those are real problems you know you made the statement um, which allowed you and even you know you go okay obviously I'm stuck here and that kind of sucks, but it really doesn't suck. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, so yeah, I, I can wallow a little bit in, in self yeah. pity and go like, I, I could have been home by now. I have a wonderful, beautiful, intelligent woman back home who I'm engaged to. We could have been married by now and we're supposed to start a family and, 
And I, I do understand that Hong Kong is a wonderful place to be stuck. I could be off a lot worse. I could be stuck on board a ship or a, a tiny island with very little to do. Uh, but I got stuck in Hong Kong and I have friends and I have a roof over my head and I get to meet wonderful people like Peter and Peter and I, we've been out for dinner a few times. And, and uh, you know, so my, my situation overall is good, but there's the mental stress of it. And I look back right. at the past seven years and yes, there have been moments where uh, there has been legit danger and I um, I could have lost my life and things could have could have gone very, very bad, very, very quickly uh, in, in a number of cases, but it's been short lived. You know, I was usually in and out of danger within a half a day or within a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's, it's a different kind of hardship. And it was a really good book to, to read um, because I do wonder if I would be able to go through what those men went through. And they seem kind of quiet about it. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have those places to go like, oh, it's really cold today. Like, I don't like this. I want to go home. Um, they, they, had their, uh, they had their journals and their diaries. And, um, and uh, you can read some of the stuff. But in the book, uh, they, they, they quote their, their journals. And it doesn't really seem like complaining. Like, it's, it's a very sort of gentleman way of, of complaining back in, in uh, yeah, 100 years ago. So, so that's quite amazing. I, I really enjoy the books. I am uh, something which which ties into that would be um, I do have this Instagram account, and I did a post about uh, wearing a mask in Hong Kong, and I just mm -hmm. sort of said that I think that one of the reasons why we're not social distancing in in mass transportation is because everybody wears a mask that that sort of helps. And uh, on top of that, that we're not wearing the masks to protect ourselves, we're doing it to protect others. So I, I thought it was like, it was a nice little post to do. And then most people got behind it and supported it. And then some people just attacked it and go like, this is draconian law and uh, we're losing our rights and constitutional uh, this and that and so on and so on. And I was like, where the heck is all of this coming from? And a lot of people were saying, just, you know, what's the big deal? Just put on a, a mask and so on. We're, we're losing our rights and this is how it begins and we're going to a very very dark place and so, so, so. so what I did was I made a comparison and said well what if we go back to second world war um, in Denmark where I'm from um, we had to black out the cities at night so they had to get um, these, these uh, blackout curtains that they could draw down so that when airplanes would go across um, they wouldn't know where the cities were they wouldn't be able to orient mm. and the cities wouldn't be bombed and so on and I was just wondering, these Instagram warriors and social media warriors, if they would be able to live through a period like Second World War, which lasted six years, uh, or if they would be the ones going like, no, I will not put up these curtains. It's my right to have all the lights on and shine, shine light up towards the sky. You're like, I, I sort of want people to understand that all of this is very temporary, that Yes, you, you might have had rights um, last year that you feel that you don't have right now, but it's, you know, it's teamwork. We're trying to accomplish something here. And if you believe in it or not, uh, just, just be on the team for a while. And it's not, you're not going to lose your rights forever. Eventually, you will be able to travel, go on a holiday. Eventually, you won't have to wear a mask. Eventually, no one will be chasing you if you don't wash your hands although you should always wash your hands. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it is, it is a strange time. And it's always good to, to compare to, to something else because the problems that we have today, sometimes they're severe, but a lot of times you can find something and, and you can go, oh, oh, well, I think I'll get through this. Uh, someone else has lived through something that's far, far hard, harder than this. Yeah, I agree. Um... You know, I know we only have so much time left. I was really wanting to talk about North Korea, but I don't know if we have time or not. Um, should we share that for another time, Thor? Or yeah, let's let's skip North Korea to, for another time. But I would like to bring uh, Hong Kong in a really, really brief story. If that's oh yes, can, please, please, yes, go, man, go. In Hong mm -hmm. Kong. So um, I was supposed to be here for four days, and uh, I arrived just as um, COVID nineteen was was breaking out in in China and, and we didn't really know about it and we didn't know how long it was going to go on or anything like this. So, so when I arrived on the ship, I just got noticed that a virus had broken out far deep inside uh, China, far away from where I was. And meanwhile, a family 
um, here in Hong Kong, an expat family said, well, if you need a place to stay, sort of like Peter, he did um, um, with uh, Adrian Belloc, uh, go like, do, do you need a place to stay? And, um, and I went like, yeah, that would be great. And they had this uh, apartment and a guest room. And I came up to their house and they weren't even there. They were uh, celebrating Chinese New Year uh, in China. And then I got the keys for the house. I walked into their house, um, people I've never met before. I was supposed to be there for four days. And after a few days, they came back from China and I met them. And then one thing led to the next and I couldn't leave uh, Hong Kong due to the virus and uh, regulations came in place and things got more and more complicated. And I ended up staying with that family for five months. So can wow. you imagine that you're going from, do you need a place to stay for a few days to staying with a family of four, a wife and husband and two wonderful boys and uh, eating with them and going hiking with them and, and, and sightseeing and uh, you know, playing games and talking and discussing with them. And now I've been in Hong Kong between January when I arrived and now it's October. And for the entire time I've been here, I haven't had to pay for accommodation. I've always been able wow. to bounce around. Uh, someone's put a roof over my head. Someone's helped me out in one way or the other. So and you realize we've got a room here. here whenever you yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, come on by. Um, Peter, he actually offered me to come and stay with him. I told me the uh, Adrian Bellock story um, when we first met and said that, you know, you're more than welcome to come and stay at my place as well. So certainly a lot of gratitude within that. And um, yeah, we have a lot to be grateful for. We just need to look for it. Right, man. I agree. I, that's that's a beautiful story about Hong Kong. And that's that's so powerful to just who you are and your journey. And it's like, you know, you show up and everything you, you've done before you precede you, you know, um, just who you are, you know, you're showing it. The journey's created who you are now. And when you show up, you just have, you know, there's so much goodwill. It's a be it's an absolutely beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, man. And I, uh, Thank you for saying I love that. that. You're welcome, man. Um, you know, there's there's a couple gratitude questions I wanted to do, so I'll, I'll try to get these through here real quick. So Thor, okay. I, I did this with Peter before, but it's it's a it's a really simplistic, like, I'm gonna ask you a question. You're just gonna give me a one word response, okay? Right. You ready? I'm gonna do a couple of these. So one is this, okay, when you hear the words, so many in my life I'm grateful for, who's the first person that popped in your mind? It's not about order, who, who popped in your mind? One word. My fiance. Fiance, okay, we're gonna go another level now. Not your fiance, so I'm just ask you again. Some of your life you're grateful for. Who pops in your head? Abdul Karim. Abdul Karim, okay, we're gonna go one more. Some of your life you're grateful for. Well, I'd, I'd say Maria. Maria, okay, okay. All right, so we already heard story, Maria's story. Let's back up and tell us about the second person you mentioned to me. Tell me, tell me why you're grateful for him. Why, why he, why he popped in? I was between a rock and a hard place in 2015 in Central Africa. Uh, my grandmother had died and uh, mm. I had to choose between completing the project or flying home and being there for the funeral. And, and I was, I had recovered from cerebral malaria and I lost my financial sponsor at the time. And I was starting to get these awful migraines. I've never had migraines in my life. So this is the first time I discovered that a migraine isn't just a headache, but it's, it's something, something else. I was the subject of extreme racism for, uh, for long, long, long periods where I, for the first time in my life, really experienced what it was to be hated due to the color of my skin. And um, a lot of things were complicated and I felt like the outside world didn't care about what I was trying to accomplish uh, and didn't understand what I was trying to do with Once Upon a Saga. And I was struggling so hard to get into a very closed off country in Central Africa. And Central Africa is amazing in so many ways, but it is a hard, hard environment. And, and a lot of people struggle in, in various ways, but it's beautiful. And there are a lot of friendly people and the food's good and the flora and the fauna. So I can, I can certainly talk it up, but I was in a really tough place and I was really, really struggling. And um, I was at this border for the third time being denied in the most horrible way to go across. And I just had nothing left within me. Um, my relationship with the, my, my now fiance back home 
the long distance relationship was really, really shaky at the time. There was, there was a lot of strain on it. And I, I mean, there was just, I couldn't see why I was in this project anymore. I'd been going for a couple of years. I was quite thin. Um, I, I was about to give up. I couldn't see if there was any, I, there was no benefit for me anymore. I, I was not doing it for myself. There was no pleasure in it for me. And I couldn't see that anyone else wanted me to do it. So the question was really, why am I still doing this? And um, I should just go home and, and have a better life than, than this. And um, in that moment, I was, I, was, I was seated on the side of the road and just wondering, you know, this border and this place and this life and this hell that I have created for myself. And I saw a taxi that was parked further up the road and decided I'm going to head over to that taxi. I don't care about my backpack. I don't care about any of that. I have money in my pocket and a credit card and my passport is on me. That taxi is going to take me to the airport. Um, I'll, I'll find a flight, connect somehow. I'm going home and this is over. I don't need this. Nobody needs this. Nobody wants this. And um, before I reached the taxi, um, Abdul Karim showed up on his little motorcycle. And Abdul Karim is uh, a guy who lives off uh, transporting people. He taxis people in the border area on his little motorcycle. And the local police told him he had to wear, uh, um, uh, he had to wear protection equipment. And um, so he took that literally. And uh, he went out and got um, like a builder's hat. <laughs> and he's riding around with that. And, and Abdul Karim had transported me two times before this. So I sort of knew him without knowing him. I just recognized his fame, face and his builder's hat. And he saw me and he saw that I was sad. And uh, he came over and he, we didn't speak the same language. So I, I, don't, I don't know what Abdul Karim said, but it, it was encouraging in, his, in the tone and, and the atmosphere. And uh, then he put his, his hand on my shoulder and uh, looked me in the eyes. And then he, he indicated I, sh I should come with him. And I hopped on the back of his motorcycle. I really didn't feel like anything. And he drove me over to a sort of tea house um, and we sat down and we had some tea and he was talking to me in a language I don't understand. And um, there was, I got some encouragement from him without even being able to speak the same language and, and understand word for word what he was saying. I, I understood that he was cheering me up and he gave me a break when I needed it. And I saw the same taxi and I decided that taxi is not taking me to the airport. That taxi is taking me 800 kilometers, some 600 miles to another border through hours and hours of, of, of jungle and dirt roads and checkpoints and to another border. And I'm going to give it another go and the system is not going to get me down. And I think essentially Abdul Karim, he, um, he saved the project. I think if he hadn't intersected um, that situation, I would have gotten into that taxi. I would have gone to the airport and I would have gotten more and more firm in my belief that I was doing the right thing and I was on my way home um, versus him coming and changing my mindset and uh, essentially helping me find that element within myself that made me fight my way out of that hole and, and get to get onward with the, with the expedition, which has now led me to be in, in Hong Kong where I've met with, with Peter and through Peter, I've been connected with you and, and we're having this conversation today. That's beautiful, man. What do you what do you think about that, Peter? You got anything you want to say about that? I think it's amazing. I'm really glad that we've we've captured this conversation because it's it's overlapping mm -hmm. in lots of different dimensions, right? We can we can see mm -hmm. how hard it has been for Thor to persist. You know, you think about anything, um, you know, but for sure he's going to look back on this and have no regrets. You know, it's 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 tough now. We know that, and and you know, it comes through some of Thor's conversation, he said, look, even doing all the social media is a chore, right? It's, it's just something that he feels he needs to do. But, you know, at some stage, all of this content that you've created is going to be powerful, you know, and someone's going to play you in a movie one day or, you know, something like that. And, you know, it'll all be worth it. And you'll be with your, you'll, you'll get married uh, finally somewhere, some, you know, I, I think you were initially planning for New Zealand. I'm not sure if that's still on the cards or what's going to happen, but, yeah, I, I really hope you do persist because you're so close um, and the world's going into this weird funk. Like you said, World War II was six years. I hope it's not something like that, but you never know, right? We, we, we kind of need to be assume the worst, I guess, and hope for the best. But uh, I really appreciate the way this conversation has come together. And 
and you know, I know we're going to do more. I hope next time we have a fourth person down to complete the quadrant. Uh, on my yeah. screen, I've got you know three out of four squares completed. Um, so adding one more person to this could be one way to play with this idea. And then the next time we have five people, the next time we have six people, and then this you know this snowballing, compounding conversation keeps on going around the world. That would be kind of a fun idea to play with. Uh, so I'm Gail telling, could be the next yeah. person down here, as as one example. Oh, for sure. I want to do Gail next time. Yeah. I, 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 Hey, the more the merrier, you know, that's where I'm at. Um, I know we only got a couple minutes left and uh, I appreciate you saying all that, Peter. I wanted to, you know, Thor, my, my final question to everybody comes on the podcast um, is if you have any, you know, you've obviously tried, you're coming from a very cool perspective. That was part of the reason I wanted to talk to, you know, if, you know, if you could just give some suggestions to people to help them either find a place of gratitude or do things that you do to actively keep yourself in practice, if you could just share a couple examples or ideas with us. I think people, they should look for their inner Maria, um, either that they're going to be Maria or they're going to look for Maria out there. Um, my father, I have, a mar I have amazing parents and they both influenced me in, in a number of different ways. And I remember my father saying, um, be good, but don't be an idiot. And, and I think there's an, a very important distinction where go out into the world and not necessarily expect prepare for the worst and expect the worst and hope for the best but but go out there and know that everything is not good and not everybody is good and uh, you can't just you know but 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 generally most people have absolutely no reason to harm you and uh, most people are just people uh, i would argue everyone's just people are just people and they get stuck in traffic and they take selfies and upload to social media and uh, they like good food and they fall in love and they get married and you know they take care of their jobs or they try to get their education and so on so so the the vast majority of people out there they are just going to point you in the right direction or help you with a translation and and uh, you know once you start seeing that suddenly there's a lot to be grateful for um because you know I've, I've reached 194 countries in an unbroken journey without flying i'm among the 300 most traveled people in the world i'm nine countries from becoming the first to reach every country in the world without flying and 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 some people will look at it and go like yeah you did that and i look back at it and go like well well i was a part of it but along with me there were thousands of people who got me to where i am today and in, in various different ways. And sometimes it's a guy like Abdul Karim that comes over and looks me in the eyes and pats me on the shoulder and helps me get a cup of tea. And sometimes it's a family that hosts me for five months when I get stuck. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of gratitude and you can find it everywhere once you start looking for it, I'm, I'm sure. That's beautiful, man. I love that. I love that a lot, man. That was really great. Uh, obviously, you know, you're, you're there and it's, it isn't just you, you know, it's, it's, it's all these moments, these kind the kindness, people caring this, all, all this, uh, it's, there's so much, right? There's so much. And that's yeah, what you just said. Right. Like, there's so much, there's so much to be grateful for in your journey. Um, you're here because of all that, grat all those gifts, the kindness that were given to you, people that cared about your journey or cared about you in that one moment, right? Just like the guy seeing you on the side of the road, right? He just saw you <laughs> and he carried enough to like, get on the back of my bike. It's powerful, man. It is powerful. It would when be, you... it, there would be so much hardship within what I do, but in the world in general, if other people didn't interact and other people didn't care uh, to, to some degree. And it's not just about what people they can give you. It's just as much. Like, I mean, like find Maria within yourself. If you see someone who looks thirsty, ask them if they want some water. Um, if you see someone that looks sad, you know, smile. And, you know, there, there's a lot you can give as well and be a part of it. You can be Maria as well as you can meet her. That's beautiful, man. Where, um, where can if you just tell everybody if they want to reach out to you or, you know, see you, can you just name off some place, the places that they can find you? Sure, sure thing. So we named the project Once Upon a Saga. That would be just like Once Upon a Time, but time has been uh, traded out for S-A-G-A, -A, Saga, Once Upon a Saga. And if you search that on the internet, you'd find uh, tons of stuff. 
Um, but the main channels are Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's YouTube, there's uh, the website uh, with a blog as well. And um, people are welcome to come and join and ask questions and, and see where I've been and, and follow the journey and see if I, I make it all the way to the end. <laughs> That's great, man. I'll definitely be following. I'll definitely put those in the show notes. I know you guys got to get going here within a minute. So Peter, you have any closing thoughts on our first Productive Accident, accident Series episode? No, I think it's amazing that the, the fact that we keep on connecting and collaborating. In fact, even the uh, the 10,000 thank yous. Oh, there we go. There's a book down the bottom. Um, the 10,000 <laughs> thank yous I did, you know, if I do one a day, that's 27.4 years. So, uh, you know, and I haven't kept up because, you know, like like Thor mentioned, it's, it's a bit of a drag sometimes to, to say, well, hang on, is this a stupid idea? Why am I even doing this? But the motivation is, I'm looking forward to reminiscing, right? If I actually do capture something good from every single day of my life for the next 27 years, it's going to be great to look back on. Plus, I, I really love how that you've picked up, you're doing 10,000 videos, and that's an extension of the 10,000 hours or the 10,000 thank yous, and that's just building on each other. So we're all kind of connecting, collaborating, inspiring each other, and I'm sure that there's other examples that we're going to keep on finding. So... Um, Keep up the great work, Chris, and keep going, Thor. Thanks, Peter. Thank well, uh, that's this has been wonderful, guys. I really appreciate you spending the morning with me. So I'm Chris with Peter and Thor, just reminding everybody to stay grateful. <laughs>